So hi everyone, um, thanks for, for joining Magnets uh, today. Um, today I'm quite happy to see, um, for those who haven't done before, we have a, a typical sort of 25 to 30 minute presentation. Kindly ask that you um, keep your microphones muted during the time so not to uh, interrupt the speaker. At the end, we will have time for a 10 to 15 minute uh, question and discussion session. If you want to ask a question, but you're not, uh, don't want to uh, unmute your microphone, please just type into the text and we can uh, read out the question uh, for you. And as always, at the end of our Magnet seminars, um, there's a, a chance for everyone to catch up and have a bit of a, a, a social uh, catch up at the end. And that part of the seminars is, is, is not um, uh, recorded. So today I'm, I'm pleased to say that we have Joe Merck from the University of Florida. Uh, and he's going to be talking us talking today uh, about some of the makeup of Proterozoic supercontinents. And so without much ado, I'll, I'll hand over to you, Joe. Okay, thanks. Okay, we good? Yeah, perfect. Okay, all right. Well, this talk asks a relatively simple question for which the answer is probably less than we think. That's not always a bad thing, of course, because it keeps us busy and uh, gives us ammunition for research grants and, and so forth. There's a lot of many non-unique interacting parts to the overall puzzle of Precambrian supercontinents. But one thing is that's missing, at least from a paleomagnetic perspective, is some measure of confidence in our paleomagnetic reconstruction. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some of the stumbling blocks um, towards reaching these Precambrian reconstructions and show kind of a first pass at providing some statistical measure of confidence to our reconstructions. So I'll start off um, again with another what should be a simple question and that is what is a supercontinent and there seems to be some reasonable disagreement about that definition. Um, there are myriad forms of geological information that suggests the Precambrian hosted at least two large land masses, perhaps more, but the makeup of those land masses and the dynamics of the assembly and breakup are known mostly in a broad temporal framework. So just kind of kind of go through what we think happened in the Precambrian, discuss briefly the non-uniqueness in geological models and piercing points, and then delve into paleomagnetic data and its role in the supercontinent story. So what makes a supercontinent? Um, well, Nance and Murphy said, basically, it should be big enough to cause its own demise and cause a repeat of the cycle. So imprint something on the mantle that causes the, the cycle to begin again. Um, in 2012, I said approximately, not exactly, 75% of continental crust at the time of formation. Uh, the current continental surface on Earth is roughly 150,000 square kilometers. Problems with these definitions um, is whether or not we would call Gondwana a supercontinent to satisfy the detailed requirements of Vance and Murphy. Um, the criticism around the 75% number uh, centers on the fact that we don't know how much crustal volume may have been present at the time of supercontinent formation, which I didn't really intend for that definition to fit. I um, really meant whatever we have preserved today, if we can fit 75% of, say, Proterozoic crust into a supercontinent, we might call it that. A number is not an exact number. Somebody asked me once, well, what about 74%? Sure. Um, I agree it's not maybe the best. Um, Mitchell argued that a supercontinent must have a large size. It's unspecified, but it must have a mantle legacy and some longevity on the order of 100 million years. Um, so these work in concert and Gondwana would constitute a supercontinent according to this definition, but Panosha um, probably would not because it does not have the longevity associated with it. So what we think we know are these um, potential supercontinental land masses in the Precambrian. And these include uh, Columbia and Nuna or Nuna. Um, I won't get into semantics about what to call it. Um, Rodinia. Uh, Panosha, perhaps, and then Paleopangea and Protopangea, which was something um, proposed by Piper in many, many papers. So this just kind of gives uh, you know a general idea of what some people thought Columbia and Nuna looked like. The second one is uh, Rodinia, and the last one here is Panosha. And so these 
you know, look like reasonable reconstructions. But when we start delving into the data behind these reconstructions, in particular the paleomagnetic data behind these re reconstructions, it gets a little more difficult. So what data other than paleomag support Precambrian continents in no particular order? There are detrital zircon records, there's records of orogenic events, records of drifting events, uh, paleomagnetic data, which is kind of the focus of this talk, but we have a growing database, but there's still issues. Um, economic deposits, their distribution, piercing points, uh, radiating dike swarms, large igneous provinces, geochemical signals. To a much lesser extent, biogeography, it really doesn't come into play um, perhaps until Pan Ocean, and even then, I think it's, it's problematic to use biogeography. But we have a collection of tools at our disposal that seem to suggest uh, that there were supercontinents in the Precambrian. And it's been often compared to trying to assemble a jigsaw puzzle um, with varying degrees of confidence. So these are just some quotes from different people. Uh, reconstructing supercontinents is like trying to assemble a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle after you've lost a bunch of pieces and your dog has chewed up the others. Pretty appropriate. Um, to solve a jigsaw puzzle, you don't necessarily need 100% of the pieces before you can look at it and say it's the Mona Lisa, but you need some key pieces. With the eyes and nose, you have a chance. Uh, Tron said, until then, our efforts resemble a jigsaw puzzle where we must contend with missing and faulty pieces and have misplaced the picture on the box. And even though these are apropos for describing some of the issues, when we go back into Precambrian, we're not really looking at a single snapshot in time. Uh, we're trying to discuss the history of supercontinents. So these continents and supercontinents are in motion. So we're trying to put together a, a moving puzzle where the pieces change location. Uh, they may change shape. And when we don't have data, they'll just go missing and they may or may not reappear depending on whether we have data uh, to support that or not. So I always sh I show this cartoon where we have a bunch of pieces here and we can look at them and we can come up with some hypothesis, uh, testable hypothesis to reconstruct these pieces into a supercontinent or into an animal. Uh, and we may be able to do that, but we don't necessarily know that what we've assembled is correct or not. Um, so what do we do? Well, we can eliminate the entire history of the Earth. We can just say it's 6,000 years old, forget about the Precambrian, forget about the Proterozoic, all that eliminates all controversy. Um, maybe a better strategy would to be accept the interesting scientific challenge and rely less on the miraculous. Although we can all feel free to return to the miraculous should the data ever lead us to that conclusion. So do we know anything? Of course, we know quite a bit about the Precambrian. If plate tectonics, and I'm assuming that plate tectonics was operating uh, certainly by the Paleoproterozoic. So if plate tectonics is due, has some mantle lithosphere feedback, then it may be supposed that the system can periodically self-organize and self-destruct. So supercontinents can form and break apart. Um, Pangaea is an excellent example of both. Um, Self-organization of Pangaea began with the formation of Gondwana around 550 million years, culminated with its maximum packing around 300 million years, and then Pangaea began to self-destruct around 180 million years. So we're pretty sure about Pangaea, but as most of you know, um, there are still some uh, rather heated arguments about the exact shape of Pangaea, and particularly whether we had a Pangaea A or a Pangaea B. And these are subtle differences and subtle arguments in my mind compared to what we're dealing with in the Precambrian. And yet, if you go to talks where you have Pangaea A and B proponents, you know that you, can, you will hear some uh, sometimes heated arguments, not always, but sometimes heated arguments. So what about earlier supercontinents? What happens when we go back beyond uh, Pangaea, when we extend ourselves all the way back into, into the Neoproterozoic or Mesoproterozoic or Paleoproterozoic? Well, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, there are plenty of papers written on, on all of this, but we have detrital zircon records of crystallization ages 
and orogenic granitoids. It seemed to suggest and seemed to correlate with times of supercontinent assembly. We have a histogram of juvenile crustal ages based on hafnium isotopic signals, uh, crustal reworking work, work, ages, the intensity of large igneous provinces over time. And these peaks in detrital zircon ages, orogenic granitoid ages, and crustal reworking correlate with proposed supercontinent assembly. Lips and juvenile crust are associated with supercontinent breakup. And these seem to correspond fairly well with the intervals of time where we think there were at least two supercontinents, namely Columbia Nuna or um, Rodinia in the, in the late Meso and Neoproterozoic. When we go to look at orogenic belts, um, these are just different pictures from authors. Um, Torres Fix picture here of Rodinia shows 1.3 to 1.1 billion year old orogenic belts that are thought to reflect the assembly of Rodinia, the so called Grenvillian age orogenic belts related to the assembly of Rodinia. Uh, Zhao et al. 2002, 2003, several different papers has outlined these 2.1 to 1.8 billion year old orogenic belts uh, throughout the world, um, which they argued related to the assembly of a, of a large supercontinent, which they also call Columbia. And of course, there are other orogenic belts, uh, such as accretionary orogenic belts shown in the bottom picture here. This is some of the um, proposals by Condi and others looking at these accretionary origins, particularly in Amazonia, Baltica, and Laurentia, where they kind of line these up um, in, a, in a reconstruction, which they call the Great Proterozoic Accretionary Orogeny. And these accretionary belts started about two and go all the way down to about 1.3 billion years. So supercontinents do exist. I'll start with that premise. Um, but how much do we really know about their configuration? So we have models and models are great, models are flexible and models because they are models are always wrong. But one of the things I like to know is how wrong are they? Um, and so again, it depends on what you put into the model. You can put garbage data, get a perfect model and end up with the garbage results. You can put in perfect data, make a garbage model and end up with garbage results. Obviously we want, perfect data, perfect model, perfect results, which is unattainable because we're scientists, we never reach perfection, but we want to approach that. And one way that we can approach that is by starting to give some statistical measure of confidence in our reconstructions. So some of the non-uniqueness problems when using geological data, um, I'll just illustrate one here, the piercing point problem um, in Rodinia and Piercing points are supposed to provide unique geological or structural connections between two continents that are now separated. And the initial proposal was SWET, the Southwestern US East Antarctica proposal shown here on top. Uh, that was modified to a, another unique piercing point model called Auswus. And finally, uh, the last model that was proposed, there's probably been other slight modifications, but Ausmex. So even though these are supposed to provide unique piercing points, unique structural and geological piercing points through Australia, Antarctica, and into uh, Western Laurentia, you can see that they vary by quite a bit. So paleomagnetism might have something to say about those. Here's a couple of other um, piercing point models. Uh, this is on the left from Rogers and Santosh, who proposed that India uh, should be aligned with the Belt Purcell and Uinta and Apache groups of Western North America. And the, the basins in India form these piercing points, these connections into North America, which we have uh, really no good data for. Um, other proposals are showing orogenic belts in Baltica, in India, Central India, and the North China Craton that are all supposed to be between about 2.1 and 1.9 billion years ago. Um, and so they show this nice linear correlation between uh, the, the orogenic belts in Fennoscandia and Central India and Indore China. The problem with this is that there are no good evidence for tectonism, for uh, strong metamorphism, deformation, or orogeny in India 
between 2.1 and 1.9. So that connection um, seems not to work very well. Well, let's turn to paleomagnetic data. And when we look at kind of the distribution and the, the number of good quality paleomagnetic poles going from the paleoproterozoic into the neoproterozoic, um, I've shown here in stars, uh, white stars and blue stars are what we call A or the best poles or B poles. So these are the ones that are supposed to be the most reliable. And then the linear portions are where we think we have more or less continuous data um, through that interval of time. And looking at this, you can see that particularly for Laurentia, Baltica, and Siberia, um, there's quite a, uh, quite a number of data that go through the entire sequence, but there are still gaps. And so the first thing that jumps out at me here is not how much data we've collected, which is still impressive, um, but how much, how many intervals where we're lacking information. So we can look at this another day, another way. Um, if we compare it to the Phanerozoic on the left, um, again, this is a kind of a silly calculation, but the Phanerozoic pole density, we have about 11 poles per 10 million years. If we look at the 1800 to 550 million year interval, uh, we have about 1.2 poles per 10 million years. But that's flawed because it assumes that there's sort of a continuous um, paleomagnetic signature through the whole time. And you can actually look at the distribution here of poles and see that there is not a continuous distribution every 1.2 poles every 10 million years. And in fact, if you compare Columbia to Rodinia, you can see that there are much, there are far more information about Rodinia than there is about Columbia. And if you look at these four continents, Laurentia, where we have 61, Australia, where we have 30, Baltica, where we have 29, and Siberia, we have 16. That means that 70% of the paleomagnetic data are from these four blocks in the 1800 to 550 million year period. And obviously, Laurentia dominates um, that database over everything else. So it's no, no surprise, I, I guess, no surprise that Laurentia is at the center of both Columbia and Rotini. If we look at the Laurentian data in a little bit closer focus, we can see a couple of things. One, we can see that there are a couple of gaps here. One, a 230 million year gap. Maybe we've had some new data, so it might be a little bit shorter, 200, 180. There are a couple of 100 million year gap intervals here. There is one particular interval in North America that is very well documented from about 1.1 uh, billion years all the way to probably about 950. Uh, much of the work that Nick Swanson Heisel and his group have done uh, and others, of course, have, have really filled in that. So that's probably one of the linchpins for any reconstructions is using that Laurentian database um, to tell us what, what's going on. Unfortunately, a lot of times in the, the Precambrian, when we're looking at paleomagnetic data and we have a 100 million year gap or a 200 million year gap, we kind of just, well, it's just, a, it's a couple hundred million years. What's well, a couple hundred million years in the Proterozoic? I think it's useful to look at the Phanerozoic and look at what can happen in 200 million years. So I show an early Jurassic reconstruction here at 195, uh, late Cretaceous in 94, and of course, modern world um, today. And you can see that there are major plate reorganizations that happen in 200 million years. So those 200 million year gaps are, are really important. And the fact that we're missing data within those 200 million year gaps can often lead to problems in our reconstructions. So paleomagnetism is foundational for making paleogeographic reconstructions. And so I just asked the simple question, where do we stand? And we just had a workshop um, in, in Norway this summer, and we reevaluated all the paleomagnetic poles. We're making a lot of good progress, but we are still dealing with data that are irregularly spaced in time and in their spatial distribution. So where, there, where we have poles, where we lack poles, it's, they're very, very, um, you know, it's not evenly distributed. So there are several approaches. Um, one is we can kind of spot check 
reconstruction poles. This is what Elming et al. did in 2021. Basically what they did with Columbia or Nuna, they came up with an assumed, presumed reconstruction of Nuna, Columbia. And then they used that and they looked at poles at different time periods and they compared that to their reconstruction and said, hey, it's pretty good. Um, the other thing you can do is you can create apparent polar wander paths, in particular where you have continents with, with a significant amount of data over time. And then you can interpolate between poles. So you can assume a configuration and then where you're missing a pole, you can add one from another continent that you think, think it was there. So this has been done quite often as well. Both of the above pro approaches do not require poles to fall on the spin axis when continents are reconstructed so I call it the close enough work. And this close enough is not really statistically evaluated in most of those models. And I think part of the reason is because it's, it's, there's no really easy way to evaluate this close enough when you have data that are irregular in space and time and dominated by just a few cratonic blocks, okay? And I will start, I will, assume that we are dealing with a geocentric axial dipole, which I know is controversial enough, especially in the ediacaran. But I'm just going to assume in order to, to test this, this model that we're dealing with a, a geocentric axial dipole. So on the far left, I show Elming et al.'s reconstructions for Columbia at 1.63 and 1.49. A billion years. We'll call it Nuna because that's what he called it. So you can see the reconstruction is uh, the same in both of these. And then the poles used for that reconstruction are shown. Um, and in a perfect world, they should all align on the spin axis. You can see that there are varying degrees of difference between the poles and the spin axis uh, at 1.63 and 1.49. And what I've done on the far right is I've taking, taken the 1.63 poles from Laurentia Baltica, North Australia, Siberia, and North China, and I put them all on the spin axis and reconstructed these to their closest approach. And you can compare that to, um, or you can compare that to the Nuna reconstruction. You can see that they're, it's not too bad. You would say, well, it's close enough, which is, which is what we typically say, it's close enough. But you can see there are some differences, particularly with the position of North China in the reconstruction of Elming et al. It's more towards the equator here. It's a little bit higher latitude. Um, Baltica is a little bit off. Siberia is a little bit off. North Australia is pretty good. And then at the bottom, I've just taken those poles uh, and reconstructed them back into the Elming et al. and shown you know how they fall with, with respect to the spin axis on there. So the errors in these paleomagnetic poles, obviously they involve a component of rotation and a component of latitudinal error in any of our reconstructions. So I started thinking about, well, how can we deal with this? Um, and Heslop and Roberts in 2019 provide a Bayesian uh, mechanism for comparing paleomagnetic poles, Palencia Ortis et al. used uh, McElhaney and McFadden's uh, reversal tests to determine whether the pole comparisons was A, B, C. And this works pretty well when the poles are the same age. But the question is, we don't always have poles of the same age in the Precambrian. So how are we going to handle poles of different ages? So this is the article by Heslop and Roberts, where they um, just give you a visual example of how these compare using probability density functions drawn along a great circle between uh, two poles. And you can see that the more overlap between uh, these probability density functions, um, the better the Bayesian fit between the two poles and the more different they are, obviously, the worse the, worse the Bayesian fit. And there are two measures that they use. One is called the Bhattacharya coefficient. The other one is a Bayes error. And these basically are where you have two, let's say you have two statistically distinct populations, P and Q, with their alpha 95 circles. Um, and 
that would mean that if there's no overlap at all, they would have a Bhattacharya coefficient equal to zero. And if we have two random observations within that alpha 95, shown here by a green star or red star, the probability of assigning the green, op uh, the green star to population Q is zero, and the probability of classifying the red star to population P is also zero. So that would give a Bay zero, zero. And if we have two statistics, statistically identical means P and Q, uh, the Bhattacharya coefficient equals one, and the probability of incorrectly classifying the green star to population Q or the red star to population P is 50%. So that leads to a Bayes error of 50%. So in terms of a perfect fit, um, we would have a Bhattacharya coefficient equal to one and a Bayes error equal to 0.5. So what did I do? I went and I took the reconstructions and I did two. Uh, I took one uh, 17, 80 million years where I tested the Samba model, which is a South America, Baltica, Laurentia fit, the great accretionary origin. And I took the 1490 Columbia fit. And what I did is I compared pole to pole in each of those. Um, and I just calculated the uh, the Bayes error about the Charia coefficient, but I'm going to use a Bayes error in this in this talk. And remember, a Bayes error of 0. 0.5 would be what we consider a perfect fit, and a Bayes error of zero would mean there's no probability of misassigning either one of those poles to, to the other population. So if we ignore age differences and use our K alpha 95 and R, then we can see for the most part the poles in these reconstructions do not overlap. So if we look at the zero to one, we have 72% and 81% of the poles. This means based on this comparison that we don't have a good fit. But our poles of course are different ages, so they may have different precisions. So is there a way we can still evaluate goodness of fit? And one way is to say, okay, well we have we actually have an error in both poles, an alpha 95 about both poles, so we can combine the errors and come up with uh, what I call C95, which is a combined error based on both alpha 95s. But what to do about different ages? Well, this one I'm, I'm willing to listen, um, but I thought one way is to add some realistic amount of rotation and latitudinal motion to that overall error. And how much to add? Well, I looked at Torsvik et al. 2012's analysis, and they came up with about 0.44 degrees per million years as the average amount of apparent polar wander plus true polar wander during the Phanerozoic. So I thought, well, you take the age differences and you multiply it by that average amount of apparent polar wander plus true polar wander, and you get this new error, which I call C95, which includes the errors in each of the poles and also the errors in the age because there must there is most likely some sort of rotational or latitudinal motion that takes place during that interval of time. And then in order to use the Heslop and Roberts, I have to take that C95 and calculate new R values and new K values, which I call pseudo R and pseudo K, and plug these back into the Heslop and Roberts test or m and 90 test, either way. And when you do that, you might guess that, okay, well, the bigger the C95, the bigger your errors, the better the fits are gonna be. And to a first order, that's kind of true, especially when you get up over a C95 of 25 to 30 degrees, but you can see the correlation between C95 and Bayes error, the R values are actually pretty low. And so I would argue that this technique is useful as long as the C95 of the, of the two poles that you're comparing are somewhat less uh, than, than 30 degrees. Uh, this just illustrates those probability density functions for three poles this, in Laurentia, the St. Francis Mountains, the Michikama and the Spokane poles here. Um, and you can see that without C95 correction, these poles uh, show very, very little overlap. And you can tell just looking at the alpha 95s, uh, they have you know, very, very low Bayes errors, very, very low Bhattacharya coefficients. And so you might say, well, hey, that one's, you know, they're different ages. They're 16 million years difference. However, you try to draw an apparent polar wander path through those poles, it actually, it will actually oscillate 
back and forth around that 1476. When you apply the C95 correction, um, you do get a little bit better fit. Um, the Bayes errors are still on the order of less than 0.2, except for the L17 and L18, where uh, they do appear to be uh, distinct poles, and yet they're very close in age, 1460 and 1463. So when I do this, when I apply the C95 correction to the 1780 and the 1490, you can see that the comparison of poles is better, um, taking into account age differences and combined errors. But overall, if you look at the blue here, if you look overall, it's still more than 50% of the poles end up with a Bayes error of less than 0.2. Um, so in my opinion, that's still concerning. Um, and here's just another example at 1630, um, where we end up with, uh, again, more than 80% of polls in this poll comparison have Bayes errors less than 0.2. Now, Heslop and Roberts argued very strongly, and I agree with them, that you should not apply a cutoff to the Bayes error and say, if the Bayes error is higher than this, we have a good fit. If it's lower than this, we have a bad fit. But I think it's okay to say that when you have Bayes errors of less than 0.2, that indicates potential issues with the proposed reconstruction and you should explore alternative fits, okay? But that's not all, because if you look at these data uh, in a little more detail, the assumption that they are Fisherian doesn't always hold true. So, uh, okay, I'm stuck. There we go. So this is a um, this is a comparison. What I did here is I took uh, India pole and the St. Francis Mountains pole, which are roughly the same age in the 1470 million year range. And if you do that Bayesian test, it, it indicates an acceptable fit between the St. Francis Mountain pole and the Loch Ness Dyke pole. But when you actually do a bootstrap um, of these two poles, I just used 2,500 for illustrative purposes here, uh, the Loch Ness Dyke uh, distribution is shown in green in the St. Francis Mountains in red. Um, essentially a much larger deviation from than expected from the overlapping alpha 95 circles and their Bayes error. In fact, there's less than 3% overlap in the mean poles taken from that bootstrap. So again, this is something that should be examined when we go back and look at um, even when we're comparing poles. So moving forward, I think I'm just about out of my time here, but moving forward, I think that data should drive our models. So it's okay to make models. It's okay to make models to test our data to make sure that they make plate tectonic sense, to make sure that you know our plate boundaries aren't jumping around. So models are good, but data has to drive the models. And the Precambrian database, whilst improving, is still meager with a few notable exceptions. We still have large gaps. Um, and I would argue that GAD means something in the Precambrian. We have to insist that it does until shown otherwise in our data. Like I said, that may be true for the Ediacaran. Uh, I'm not sure, but at least the tests that we've been able to do, some of the tests that have been done, Evans has done some, other people, seem to suggest that the geocentric axial dipole model is reasonable. I know there are some G2 and G3 components, but for the most part, shouldn't be too much deviation from GAD. Um, but I think that we need to add and need to start thinking about statistical assessments of reconstructions, apparent polar wander paths, and kinematic models. And those should be used where possible and developed where absent. Um, and others who may have a good sense of paleomagnetic uncertainties, uh, or who may not, I should say, the caution here is that others who may not have a good sense of paleomagnetic uncertainties use our reconstructions to create other models. So when we put out a Rodinia model in 2008 that has largely been accepted by the geological community as this is Rodinia, when it's probably not Rodinia, um, we should be careful about how we present our reconstructions and our models and at least apply and work to develop some sort of statistical assessment of those models so that we can let them know, hey, here's our model. 
these are the uncertainties associated with our model where they have been quantified in some manner or another. I'm not saying it has to be my method. It's just something I played around with. Um, and it seemed to indicate to me that at least one model that I applied it to doesn't seem to fit very well. So I'll stop there. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, we can all give uh, Joe a, a virtual round of applause um, for a really interesting talk, a couple of a lot of different ideas there. Um, so I can open the floor uh, to, to, to questions. If anybody has a question, you can please uh, raise your hand and I'll invite you to, to, to unmute. Hi, Joe. Hi. Hey, nice talk again. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just speaking up, and someone's. I it's any okay. I was. I was. I was about to to note your comment in the <laughs> All right, chat. No there, problem. So, um, so um, yeah. So th this is um, the uncertainty aspect that you raise is is really important, and I think um, we need to be developing some way or another. And the C95 is is one way to do it. I think Lei Wu um, proposed another one, which is also kind of a a bootstrap approach of incorporating the both the A95 and the um, the time errors in the, in various polls. So there's these, these variations going on. My question to you is about your approach is, have you tried it for the paleomagnetic data in the Torsvik database just for Pangaea at 200 million years to see how I, well? I, I, I have not, but that's a good idea. <laughs> um, My it, suspicion it, is, it, this is a point that Dave Rowley made. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you off. It's just really the, the natural follow on my question. My suspicion is um, from the point that Dave Rowley made in a paper about um, reconstructions of the Proto-Tibetan Plateau and accretion models of Tibet is that one of the reasons why there's such poor fitting of individual poles relative to each other is that there are hidden uncertainties that go far beyond the precisions of our data, um, such as maybe um, the questions about inclination shallowing in sedimentary rocks, questions about uh, primary tilt in um, unstratified rocks like igneous rocks, um, as well as applying ages of magnetization. So for it's for that reason that when I make my own models, I'm happy to get the A95s close to the spin axis, but that's why I don't insist that they they all come, because I'm pretty much kind of in my mind adding 10 degrees of uncertainty every time. And if I were to try to force fit all those um, holes within their A95s, um, you'd get really, really jumpy kind of models. You've probably done the same. So just to, your, the, if you can comment on that and um, think about ways in which um, we might apply this to Pangaea as a testing ground. Yeah, so I mean, it's a good idea to to apply this to to Pangaea, and and I think when you when you're looking at small smaller bits and pieces, I think that the the problems probably are magnified a bit. Um, but I think if we're looking at at big picture, um, I think C95 is really liberal, um, and looking at I think it it probably. I'm just guessing. It probably includes uncertainty associated with things like inclination shallowing and so forth, because the C95s um, are, are actually quite large, uh, larger than I think they need to be. But, but even then, with those large C95s, the fact that a lot of these pole comparisons still show relatively poor fits, um, I think is concerning. With regard to your models and forcing them to sit on the spin axis, if I if I led anyone to believe that that's what I was insisting, that's incorrect. What I'm insisting is that we should compare when we have our models. We should actually look at the fits and say, okay, well, is there is there some tweaking? I mean, in some cases, you might just have to, you might just say, okay, well, we actually need to rotate Baltica a little bit, and we'll get a much better fit. Um, all I did at this first pass was look at the Elming model. Um, I've started to look at a couple of other models, but I think your, I would call it proof of concept in the Phanerozoic uh, would be a useful, though quite tedious exercise, <laughs> but yeah, thanks. Well, just, just thanks, just for Pangaea 200 when people all agree yeah. on Pangaea A, that would be cool, yeah. thanks. Yeah, so, sure. Thanks very much. Um, we could have time for another question. So Phil, I see you have your hands up. 
Uh, sure. I'll take it down. Uh, thanks, Joe. That was a, a really neat presentation and, and I think a much needed kind of analysis. I very much agree with one of your points here that it would be very good to have and start incorporating some kind of statistical assessment and to make it as clear as possible what the assessment is. And the danger is, of course, is it starts getting quite murky when we start throwing a bunch of different statistical methods at people and, and adding things on. Uh, but in danger of, of making it more complex, I'm going to suggest one other thing out of your talk. You were comparing uh, St. Francis Mountains and, and some others in around the, in around the uh, 1400s, 1470s, I guess. Um, and noting that two of the poles, one was 1463, one was 1460, they were quite different for Laurentia. Um, one thing that's explicitly not in your analysis yet, yet but I think is very important for GAD behavior is we have paleosecular variation. So one additional thing that we could do with this kind of approach, again, with the danger of potentially making it so complex, is to simply roll in some, like you did for uh, you know, the, the uh, motion of 0.44 degrees per million years, you know, that's sort of an, uh, a broadly perhaps acceptable plate motion, one could also roll in some amount of paleosecular variation. And so any individual pull, we all understand that it's not, it's not actually a spot reading of the spin axis. It's going to have some amount of, of, of paleosecular variation, even when in the individual result, we claim that we've isolated all of that. There's always, you take any group of poles for Pangaea, for instance, you don't get everything on top of the spin axis. There's always some offsets, and that could be dealt with by some kind of assessment of PSB. It's a little murky because if we do that, then we're we're potentially saying that individual results aren't averaging paleocyclic variation, whereas you know in many cases they are, especially for intrusions. But uh, yeah. anyway, that's my I mean, comment. I I like that. I wonder if you have a preferred paleosecular variation model for the Proterozoic, which we could apply. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you, you use Phanerozoic for plate motions, right? So, yeah. yeah. Sure. OK. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks very much. And we have time for, for another uh, quick question, if anybody uh, wants to throw their hand up. So if not, I, oh, there we go. There's Lisa. Um, on you go, Lisa. Hi, I just was um, looking at the um, JGR table of contents for this, this month's issue, and there's another uh, statistical approach proposed by uh, Rose and Zhang and Nick Swanson Heisel, Bayesian paleomagnetic Euler pole inversion for paleogeographic reconstruction and analysis. So it sounds like there's going to be, there's a lot of work being done on this exact topic with very different approaches. And I, I think that's really exciting. Um, uh, maybe we'll get somewhere if we combine them all and figure out what's the best way forward. Um, so uh, I, I haven't read the paper yet. I just, it was in my inbox this morning, but um, so it's a, it's a vibrant topic. And uh, yeah. thank you for your presentation because that sets the table pretty nicely for, for future work. Thanks, thanks. I'll look. I'll look for that paper. I'm glad people are working on this. Yeah, there's the Australian group, and then there's Nick, and and I know there's others thinking about this. Great. So thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I, I do have a kind of quick, quick question, or maybe a quick question. Uh, just on your previous slide, when you were comparing the distribution of poles, and and really. Uh, I don't want to open up the can of worms that is, uh, is you know, our, our, our directions Fisher distributed or our poles Fisher distributed, but, you know, I, I, you know, has anybody actually tried to look at uh, an approach to, to, to combining these, these different uh, types of data where they are very clearly uh, distributed in, in very different ways? Yes, so the Haslop and Roberts model um, and uses VGPs with the assumption that they are Fisher distributions. Obviously, 
not all the data in this database are have Fisher distribution. Some are really skewed. Some of the, the polls are really skewed. So I've just started looking at the distribution of the polls. I haven't looked yet at directions, but I started looking at the distribution in poll space. Yes, good point. Yeah, so I mean, my kind of approach to these, you know, very big intractable problems, um, my approach, at least from a peer intensity perspective, is is just throw as much data at it as possible and look at things from a, a stochastic and statistical approach. So, you know, there are obviously a lot of um, uncertainties that get propagated through the whole process, um, and many of them we don't necessarily. Uh, no nice statistical descriptions of them, but we can provide approximations. Uh, and I wonder, has anybody ever tried just doing a, a large scale st stochastic ensemble model where they're really trying to propagate through all the, the diversity, the, the aspects of secular variation, aspects of, of motion during miss missing uh, data gaps, uncertainties that we have associated with, with um, uh, tilt corrections and, 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 and measurements and all these things. Has anybody sort of gone to that level? It sounds horrible, but <laughs> <laughs> it does sound it does sound horrible. But uh, I know I I can say no. I have not. Um, Excellent. Um, well, I think maybe maybe we should uh, uh, wrap up uh, the session today. So I, I just want to thank Joe uh, again, and can I give give Joe another uh, virtual round of applause for uh, a really uh, interesting talk that um, raised a lot of issues that we need to to, to think about as a, a, a as a community. Um, so just uh, before we completely end for today, um, just a quick uh, 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 reminder. We have one more uh, presentation scheduled for, for, for this year um, in a few weeks in, in, in November, but we are um, soliciting speakers for our 2023 season. So if you are interested or you know of somebody who is interested in giving a presentation, please reach out to us. And we're always keen to uh, encourage uh, early career scientists um, to use magnets as a platform to promote themselves get to, to see people collaborate with people that they might not necessarily see uh, on a regular basis. And, and as always, um, today's presentation and all our other presentations will be uh, available on our YouTube channel. So please, if you've missed anything, you want to catch up with anything that we've had before, please just jump onto our YouTube channel. And uh, thank you everyone for joining Magnets tonight. Cheers.